What's the connection between spinners and the clutching construction? Today, we are going to talk about an important mathematical object, spinners. It determines the properties of atoms in the form of electron shells. It's responsible for the stability of matter. Without it, the periodic table wouldn't exist. And also quarks, which make up protons and neutrons. It's the idea behind Christopher Nolan's tenet. Remember, similar pairs of objects, one traveling forward through time, the other one going backwards. It's also closely related to the monolith in Sir Roger Penrose's favorite movie, A Space Odyssey 2001. The spinners have been much like the monolith for almost a century. When Paul Dirac put in order the discoveries of quantum physics, he discovered counterparts to electrons with negative energy. And in doing so, he opened a portal into a reality much larger than what we used to know at the time. So, spinners are really deep down in the reality and they're responsible for everything that we are seeing right now. Now, in order to see how and what we know about spinners, we're going to turn to the graph. Edits suggested by the other EW. Listen, if one wants to summarize our knowledge of physics in the briefest possible terms, there are three really fundamental observations. One, space-time is a pseudo-Riemannian manifold M endowed with a metric tensor and governed by geometrical laws. Two, over M is a principal G bundle with a non-abelian structure group G. Three, fermions are sections of S hat positive tensor product V sub R, quantity direct sum with S hat negative tensor product V sub R tilde. R and R tilde should be complex linear representations of G, and so they are not equivalent. The interaction between the Higgs field and the fermionic sections explains why the light fermions are light and presumably has its origins in a representation difference delta in some underlying theory. All of this must be supplemented with the understanding that the geometrical laws obeyed by the metric tensor the Higgs field, the gauge fields, and the fermions are to be interpreted in quantum mechanical terms. <clears throat> now, we've taken the liberty to undertake the iconic wall at the Stony Brook University and do some graffiti by adding the cosmological constant to the Einstein equation at the center of the wall. And closely related to this topic is the Dirac equation, which remains the same as before. Now, in this exposition, the main reference would be the tone, the book by Sir Roger Penrose called The Road to Reality. It has 34 chapters, but there are about a quarter of them most related to this exposition including chapter 10, surfaces, chapter 11, hypercomplex numbers, chapter 12, manifolds of n dimensions, and quite a few other chapters. Sir Roger Penrose is the prominent figure at the nexus of physics and geometry. He was born in 1931. He did his undergraduate studies in University College London. Then he went to Cambridge University to do his graduate studies. He got his PhD in algebraic geometry, but a certain question in uh, cosmology regarding the expansion of the universe motivated him to work on physics problems. Now, in the standard cosmological models, <clears throat> the universe 
can be thought of as a three surface at each point of cosmological instant of time. Now, if we further assume that the curvature is positive and we keep out the cosmological constant, then we're going to have a three surface as a three sphere at each point of time by keeping the time constant. Now, the way that we can visualize a three sphere using our visual coordinates is to use the hop vibration and also the stereographic projection to bring it down to the Euclidean three space that we are familiar with. The picture is inspired by Doror Barnatan from the University of Toronto. In the base space, in order to see where you are, we've used the geographical map. And at each point of the base space, there's a circle. And it's obvious that the circles are linked and this doesn't lead to a trivial bundle. And as a three surface embedded in a four dimensional Euclidean space, it has a hole with an interesting topology. Now, Pendles attended one of Dirac's courses on spinners and quantum field theory, where uh, it was absolutely necessary for him to understand two component spinners. Now, the way that Sir Roger Penrose explains spinners is a setting of uh, a flagpole, a pole and a flag. And through 360 degrees of rotation of the pole, the flag changes its sign. And in order to get to the initial configuration, uh, the setting needs to be rotated 720 degrees. And these are natural objects that can be found in, the, in real life. As an alternative way to visualize spinners is to turn to the belt trick. Suppose we have uh, two different frames. One of them is fixed and the other one is moving. And at one point of the belt, we have the fixed frame, and at the other end, we have the moving frame. Now, if we take the moving frame and rotate that, one pi, then another pi to make, it, to make two pies, which amounts to 360 degrees of rotation, what we get as a result is a twist in the belt. Now, that twist uh, we can't get rid of. But if we continue the rotation by two more pies to get four pies, which in total makes 720 degrees, we still get the twist in the belt. But this time is different because using parallel transport, we can undo the twist. Now, parallel transport is a kind of transformation that doesn't allow reorientation of the moving frame. But this uh, gives us a way to shrink away the four pi loop and get no twist at all and get back to the initial condition at the beginning, which is no twist at all. And this is called the belt trick. Now, the total space at each point of a manifold divides into two different bundles, which can be summed up using the direct sum operator, the normal bundle and the tangent bundle. Now, the way that we get these vectors in these bundles is to use the exterior derivative. And at each point of a manifold, we can have vectors in both bundles. Referring to the picture, the golden arrow is in the normal bundle and x, content, x, con x constant and y constant vectors are respectively the red arrow and the green arrow which are in the tangent bundle and this is a two manifold embedded in a three dimensional space. Now there are uh, vector bundles that are non-trivial 
And for example, on a sphere, we can't have a trivial vector bundle. And we use the clutching construction in order to get one. Suppose that we have two different disks identified with four points at the boundaries, such that when we glue them together, aligned with the corresponding points, they make a sphere. So we have the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere and the equator where they meet. We take a frame on the northern hemisphere, parallel transport that to the points. Then they twist as they go and pass over the boundary. Now there's going to be a twist with respect to a fixed frame. We can determine the degree of the rotation, but the, for the sign, in order to see how uh, they rotate, we're going to need two other dummy points. This requires a little bit of intuition in order to see how they twist as they pass the equator into the other hemisphere. And then we're going to see <coughs> that the twist sign in this case is going to be negative identified with the clockwise rotation and by symmetry we can conclude that the rotation along the equator is a continuous one and it seems to be two complete rounds of rotation along a great circle so look a sphere has a great circle such as the equator and then uh, passing from one hemisphere to the other one, a frame of reference necessarily has to twist. So from a point to the antipodal point on the other side, we're going to have 360 degrees of rotation. But then in order to get back to the starting point, the frame needs to be rotated another 360 degrees of rotation. And in total, we're going to have 720 degrees. And that's on the, sur on the surface of a sphere. Now, the vector bundle over sphere is a non-trivial one because passing through a great circle, the frames are going to twist. So we're going to see how this vector bundle, which is non-trivial, is a real bundle. So we take the two manifold, S2 in R3, given by x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 1. Next, we're going to identify the poles and remove them. N positive 0, 0, 1 in S2 and N negative in coordinates 0, 0, minus 1. Because we don't want to, we don't want the x and y to be zero at the same time. Otherwise, we wouldn't get something to determine the orientation. So we have u positive and u negative in S2, excluding the poles. Next, we're going to define the clutching function at the equator as a great circle, which maps uh, the circle into a general linear group of real dimension two, which is our abstract space where the spinorial vectors reside. Then we're going to need a dummy function labeled as P in order, in order to see how we can use any point on the sphere and map it to the circle on the equator given by x, y, and z maps to x and y over the square root of x squared plus y squared. And that's the magical square root so using the dummy function p now we can extend the clutching function as a composition f over bar equals fop that takes points in the intersection of u positive and u negative and takes them to the general linear group of real dimension two now there's going to be an equivalence class because the the intersection is non-empty and there, using the extended clutching function, we can reorient vectors in the tangent space. And so the equivalence class of the vector bundle 
uses effectively the extended clutching function to resolve the conflict in orientation. And then we're going to have our projection map, which essentially removes the extra piece of information, the one component that is the vector in the abstract vector space, and maps the vector bundle in, onto the sphere. That gives us an R vector bundle of rank two over S2. Each vector collapses onto a single point on the base space. Next, we're going to have the quotient map, which uh, formalizes the equivalence class in the vector bundle by the disjoint union of a trivial cross product. But then we're going to see how uh, using function f, this trivial cross product turns into a non-trivial vector bundle. Now, naturally, the quotient map is going to divide into two different parts, sigma positive and sigma negative, because we have two different domains, the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And that's where we, we have two different quotient maps. And passing from one hemisphere to the other one, the extended clutching function is going to determine how uh, the vector in the tangent space is going to rotate. So we have x, y, z, and v in the southern hemisphere, and we have x, y, z, f of x, y, and z dot b in the northern hemisphere. Next, uh, using what we have, we can define our formal bundle charts in both hemispheres by taking vectors in the tangent space and mapping them into a simple cross product of the domain on the sphere and a two real dimensional space. And that requires using the inverse of the quotient map. And these formal bundle charts are supposed to be smooth because when using the inverse of the quotient map, the clutching construction comes into play and acts as a natural and smooth way to reorient vectors. So that gives us a vector bundle E sub f over the sphere with the base space S2, the fiber space R2, formal bundle charts, phi positive and phi negative, and the projection map pi which removes the piece of information and uses the clutching function, E sub f into S2. So, we see how fermions are sections of vector bundles in the standard model of particle physics. Then, we saw that how uh, there are vector bundles that are trivial, but when they're glued together, we saw in a geometrical way how they can become spinorial, and that gives us a spinner field. As vectors on the base space, and these are one component, these are one component spinners because uh, the twist uh, requires only one variable to determine. Now, if we identify the equator, the circle, with S1, and identify the twist with the Lie group SO2, then we're going to have our function F from S1 into S2, SO2. So the reason why we're all going to these dangerous places is to gather pieces to build an, in to build an interstellar engine. And this has been only a part of the kitchen sink of the project Porta. So probably we're going to need six objects and three different concept classes. So stay tuned, more will come your way. And please send me your questions. I, might, I may not respond, but I may use them. So thanks for your attention.
Until next time.